The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is the Off-Road Racer Podcast, and I'm, my, I'm here with my good friend, Wes Miller. What's up, brother? Just chilling, man. Good yeah, to see you. Likewise. Uh, hey, I got to give props for the, for the shirt. I really appreciate, you know, people rocking the old punk rock stuff. There you go. Black flag, baby. Yeah, the Everything Went Black album. That was a bad one. Yep. Yeah, that's, I love the old school stuff. Like, we were talking earlier about some of the stuff that you've been doing lately with, you know, really, like, kind of re reengaging with huevos which is pretty cool yeah yeah for sure we uh you know when we shot those films we shot the majority of it especially the beginning on 16 millimeter film and i still have the negs so we retransferred those um for your more techie people 16 millimeter film is native 2k yeah so back in the day we were transferring it into sd so yeah. we were kind of dummying it down to put it out well, on VHS. we're also or... broke, right? Because <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was going out on VHS or DVD, and right. the HD didn't exist. So, so. It's funny. I don't know about you, but now, like, some of that stuff I look at, and I'm, like, horrified by how bad the resolution is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty funny, I think, to go back and look at SD footage, you know, versus, like, 4K or 8K or something now. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, so we retransferred all of that, and we're working on a Huevos documentary. So that's been exciting. Last November, we did a Huevos reunion, and uh, I held a race called the Huevos Pro Invitational. So we did all that out in Vegas and had a good time. It was awesome seeing everybody. Yeah, it was. It's 25 years since the first Huevos came out. So. Uh, a few of the guys I didn't recognize anymore. <laughs> but Of uh, course, right? But you know, it, it was cool to go do some bench racing and you know, tell some old stories and definitely looking forward to this documentary coming out. Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, we learned that in in skateboarding, like those the skate films that def they really defined our culture, right? And you know, it wasn't just the performance of skateboarding, it was showing the the partying and the the travel and the you know the food and the shenanigans the lifestyle of skateboarding and then obviously that transferred into you know early freestyle motocross films and and then what you were doing and you, you were really the only not just the only one doing it but you were doing it at a pretty high level you know cinematically and and I remember seeing the stuff and being like you know okay shit I don't know this guy but you know he has his shit to get whoever's doing this is is really making an effort to make these good. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, well, first of all, growing up, you know, I, I grew up kind of in the action sports culture. And, uh, you know, I think what really influenced me was a, a film called Run Man. Yep. Uh, which was a, a surf video that some guys out of Malibu did. Yeah. And when I was in college, some of my buddies that were like super into surfing that lived like in Newport, Corona Del Mar area, they turned me on to those videos. And uh, that was really, I think, kind of the first action sports video that mixed it, it wasn't so much just all the sport yeah it had all the shenanigans going yeah, it showed on showed the lifestyle and uh that just kind of really resonated with me i felt like and then you know from there then you had like the whiskey series um you know and then when crusty came out that kind of yeah. opened the floodgates for the power sports industry in my yeah opinion. It's funny, too, because the Krusty series and then, you know, consequently all the films that, you know, spawned out of that, uh, you know, to me it made total sense because it was like, that's what we were doing, right? So we let's show the actual true lifestyle of, of in that particular, 
you know, era, it was motocross and freestyle, right? And and freestyle was just developing as a a, a new expression of moto, right? Well, so was, I thought it was really cool, and I I really thought it was important to have the people that were part of the culture creating the content rather than it being this like thing that had happened before in surfing and skateboarding where it was like they were trying to put it into this clean box where like nobody swore nobody drank or did drugs and there were no girls right it was like totally like clinical you know and it's like oh you should you know go compete at these skateboard contests and i'm like yeah it looks lame but when right. the first skate films came out and you know even the earlier paul powell peralta ones which were pretty tame you know yeah. in in retrospect but i was like oh okay that's cool i want to be a skateboarder yeah yeah for sure you know i think for me you know i i had gone to san diego state and then i moved to newport beach and at that time in, in my opinion orange county was kind of the epicenter of a lot of culture that was uh, sure. permeating through the world and you know so a lot of the crusty guys were out of huntington you had LBZ out of Huntington, yep. which had the whole kind of baggy look, which was kind of crossing over that snowboard look into motocross and kind of uh, what became a bad boy image a little bit, I think. Well, uh, SRH, too. They were one of the first ones, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think you had LBZ first and then SRH soon after. Right. But um, but yeah, SRH was definitely involved. And, and I knew those guys from my days in San Diego. Yeah. Um, cause they were club promoters yeah. back when I was in, in college down there. Yep. Um, you know, so yeah, the whole SRH thing that, that, uh, well actually you know, I was thinking of SMP, Yeah. but, uh, yeah, SRH was music and stuff. And yeah. then SMP was the other clothing yep. brand SMP. Was doing ba baggy mm -hmm. stuff. But, um, but anyways, with that, um, and then kind of to touch on, you know, the, the filmmaking that we were doing when I did it kind of just whenever I do anything, I want to do it right. Right. And, you know, I wanted to be able to do slow motion. And at that time to do slow-mo, you had to shoot it on film. Yeah. The good motocross films that were out there were shot on film. Yeah. So I kind of knew that that's where the bar had been set. Um, and really as a, a quad rider coming into it, I had a chip on my shoulder of one of the whole reasons I did it is a lot of my buddies were dirt bike guys. And I was just tired of them talking shit and you know, making fun of quads and couches and this <clears throat> and that. And I'm like, dude, on a lot of tracks, we're as fast or faster than the majority of you guys. And a lot of places we're going, we're hitting jumps as big or bigger than a lot of you guys. So really the whole goal with the first films that I was doing was, you know, showing people what quads could do and that they could also be cool and really trying to get some street cred. Sure. You know? And, uh, you know, I mean, at end of the day, I think it was all about getting that street cred and trying to gain some notoriety. Um, and, and in that whole culture, you know, you're talking about the partying and the chicks and all of this. And it was like, well, if you had a cool video and you had a, a, good segment in a video like girls would see that oh yeah <laughs> and uh you know that was a, a pathway to uh getting more attention from them so you know, the, the, the whole thing you know i was in my like mid to late 20s when that was going right. on you know and you have a, a lot different mentality than uh you're having i would fun. say i do now <laughs> yeah no you're having fun i mean i was there skateboarding and it was like yeah it was a blast man it was and and then you know, I, I'm sure you felt this too. Like what I, it, it's part of unlocking the power of creativity. What I discovered was like, uh, you know, we're not just making films for, you know, the sake of it. It's like, we're selling a shit ton of product. Right. And we're, we're making stars, right. We were taking, you know, and this is long before the internet and social media. And we were taking, you know, in, in my case, it was, it was with Osiris shoes and we were taking like most of the, the skateboarders were like at best B level skateboarders and we're turning them into rock stars. And it was funny to watch because not only did it, it not only did it turn them into rock stars, but it made them better because th they began to believe in themselves. Cause they're like, Oh wow. Everybody's like giving me props. Right. And 
even though they weren't the top level at the beginning of it, a lot of them, you know, that energy that pu pushed them and, ex and and the whole thing accelerated and perpetuated itself, right? And then the f one of the funny stories I have is I remember I, I was a lot of friends in the industry and a lot of skateboarders and, and a lot of my friends were top skateboarders. And after we had, you know, put out uh, the the storm and we had done some some of our marketing with Osiris, they were mad at me. They're like, that guy's not that good. Why is he getting all this attention? And it was funny because I realized our power. And then also that, you know, being technically the best athlete is less important than, you know, your branding and your image, right? And your style, right? Because like, especially in skateboarding, because co competition did not define everything, right? It was, you know, you open up a magazine and it was 80%, you know, just free skating, you know, and not, or 90% free skating and, and not competition. And I think that what you were doing also embodied that because it was like, yes, there was a competitive side of it. There was racing, there was, you know, freestyle contests. But the thing that really pushed the needle was these beautiful shots, you know, shot at these, you know, really cool locations and these tracks and jumps that you guys built and it's like, you could tell, like, okay, we shot this at the right time of day. The light looks correct. You know, there's a reference to the ground, so you can tell how high he's sending it, you know. And then after you see the act of that, then there was this kind of process of, like, seeing this guy on film, you know, and who he was. And you're like, okay, that guy's cool. I want to hang out with him, you know. Yeah. You know, I think to touch on what you're saying, <clears throat> definitely perception's reality. So how you're branding yourself as an athlete, you know, it, I mean, it happens all the time where not necessarily the most talented athlete gets the most exposure. It's the one that is the best at marketing themselves. Sure. Um, you know, so, and in using vehicles like films, you know, back in the day, magazines. Yeah. But now I guess it'd be more website or yeah, so, I don't, so, yeah. social media, I guess. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's funny because I, I think mag it's about time to to bring magazines back because of yeah. of how fragmented social media is. But anyways, continue. Yeah, no, no I agree with you on that. Um, but yeah, you know, so through those, you know, so you could have a writer that, say he test rode for a magazine and he was doing tons of photo shoots and he's in every magazine and he's yeah. in a ton of ads and he's great at marketing himself that's more well known than a top racer. Yeah. And uh, you know so it it's it's interesting to look at and and definitely I think the action sports films played a, a huge role in that. And you know that was something when we first started doing the Webos videos um, when I first went back east a lot of those guys they weren't part of the action sports culture. So right. they really didn't understand it and their parents didn't understand it. And there was a little bit of hesitation to be in, in our films in the beginning. Right. I kind of had to more talk people into it or ask favors, you know? And, um, but then when the, when the first one started coming out and all of a sudden they're on a kiosk in their local motorcycle shop and they're playing on a TV yeah. and they're seeing these guys and they're seeing the guys that were in it, how much exposure they're getting. Game changer. The, yeah, yeah. Then it was like the floodgates opened. Yeah. No, that, that's cool. Um, I mean, it was for me. It was really f fun to learn from that process and and to understand as a creative, and and to a little bit of, as a businessman because you know you had to figure out you know how to get it paid for and sponsorship and deals and all this kind of stuff and and then later on you guys were doing demos right. And so then it's like you're running this whole business to blow up these athletes and then, you know, sell a brand. And for, for you guys, it, you know, it's funny because we talk about this retroactively and it blows my mind that the UTV companies weren't like, Wes Miller, you're selling quads for us. We want to give you a shit ton of money, you know. And I remember going through the same thing with Freestyle Moto and going to these moto brands and these guys are looking at me and they're like, we will never give you money for freestyle moto. And I'm like, well, why? Like, this is going to sell your product. And, and they were, they were just so, they were so opposed to it for lots of reasons, but you know, they, they use safety as the excuse, but really what I found out later it was, was that 
if you could go out and you could take a nobody and you could do this remarkable piece of content and that had more value than their race team, than the tradition that they'd built, like that was a total threat to them, right? And they had built the system where they had kind of control of everything. And it's, I think it's true of Supercross and Motocross today. And that was why freestyle, you know, moto, when that came out, it was so well received and so radical is that that's what the kids wanted, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and I... So Mitch, why is this bike so drippy? It's our 23 race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. And a gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works, Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. I had a, a similar experience with, you know, when we were doing the Huevos videos, when we would try to get support, especially when we started the Bomb Squad freestyle team and y'all you know, wanted to get vehicles for those guys to ride on and you know, we're trying to get financial backing. And really the Japanese manufacturers, it was just a stone wall. Yeah. And you know, they were like, no way. But in their defense, they went through, in the ATV industry, the whole um, CPSC deal with three-wheelers and yeah. all of that. So I think they, especially their legal departments, were very gun-shy. They're still gun-shy. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, the, the rules that they have to go through for their commercials and things right. like that, of like wheels can't be spinning and leave the ground. Oh, we and, <laughs> we so, dealt with it yeah. with Polaris. So I remember, you know, doing the first XP1K and then, you know, we have to send it up the chain and they're just like, why did you do this? We're not going to approve this. You guys can't put this out. And, you know, Scanlon was there at the time and he's like, no, we're putting it out, you know, but it was like, again, every attorney was like, I'm going to quit and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, that was part of the UTV underground um, thing where we could do it through UTV underground and Polaris was just a sponsor. So, it somewhat released him of, of the liability, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like, you know, I look at now it's very easy for me to look at like these cultural pillars, like, and see like, Oh yeah. And then this film dropped and then everything went crazy. Right. And it's true of action sports culture throughout the years. Right where it's that happened in surfing, it happened in snowboarding, it happened in skateboarding, you know, it happened in freestyle motocross, it happened with quads. And it's weird to me that the industry doesn't understand that. Uh, they do in skateboarding because they all make their own skateboard films, right? And we understood it in freestyle, you know, the, you know that's why LBZ and SRH and all the companies that were endemic to the culture, they jumped on it. But then it wasn't, you know, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Honda going, oh, yeah, this is good. Like, let's put money, you know, behind it. They were like, no, man, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, and that's when we were doing the Huevos videos. We had the Bomb Squad. Um, we were looking for support, and we weren't really getting much from the manufacturers. I think, uh, actually, Yamaha helped out a little bit for a little while, but it was kind of... Uh, backdoor, you know, not out in the open support. Um, but then uh, Polaris ended up, they were coming out with the Outlaw, which was a, a 450. Right. And then they also had a 525. And I reached out to their marketing director at the time. And, and we talked and we ended up working out a deal where I did all of their dealer intro footage we actually helped launch it to their dealers at a stadium or an arena back in uh, Nashville. So at the time, Caleb Moore was riding with us. So he backflipped as they debuted the new 450 to all of their dealers who had never seen it. Caleb Moore backflipped it in the arena, um, which was you know pretty cool. It blew and, their minds, I and imagine. Then, and then we had. At the time, to do super slow-mo, you needed a camera called a Phantom. Yep. And we had gone out to Glamis and these other tracks, and I'd done all this Phantom footage. And you know, it was about a $150,000 camera yep. rig that we were using, and I had helicopters and everything. 
And so, I mean, we really went over the top, but that started my relationship with Polaris. Yeah. And at the time, I felt like H Bomb Films and Huevos, we carried a lot of street cred in the power sports industry. And up to that point, Polaris is pretty much known for the sportsman. Right. And you know, the Razor didn't exist yet. They were kind of known for utility quads. Yeah, they were building farm and, equipment. You know, and snowmobiles, right? Yeah, yeah. And but they're in the ATV industry. They weren't really a player. Yeah, I mean, they, they well, they were, I think they're selling a fair amount of units, but they weren't considered super high end. Um, and I guess, for lack of a better term, I just would say they didn't have that street cred. Right. So by you know starting that relationship with us, I think that really kind of helped get them into it. And at the same time, to give them credit, I think they started to kind of up their game as far as the products that they were putting out and the like, fit and finish on things. And, you know, their, their products became better and better sure. o- over the years. Um, but you know, that, that really kind of started my relationship with Polaris and then not soon after that, actually, I think I want to say that very same, um, dealer intro, they debuted the razor. It was the 800 razor because I think a guy double jumped it into the arena. So the same jump or right next to it where Caleb backflipped in, a guy double jumped the razor in. And and then we did some little stuff with razors in the Huevos videos too, which I think kind of gave that a little bit of credibility. You know, one of the things to kind of, this is a little off subject, but with the whole start of UTVs, you know, rhinos were kind of the, the first thing yeah. that guys were racing and, yep. and fixing up. And one of my good buddies, Dana Creech, he was, he kept getting hurt, crashing on his quad and he was kind of like over it. And he's just like, dude, this is the next big thing. This is the next big thing. And like I had built one and every time I went out in the damn thing, it broke. Right. And I was just like, these are stupid. <laughs> the, yeah. It, it's like, I hate this thing because every time the steering rack broke, well, literally every time it left the ground. And then those early cars, like you had to sink so much money in them to just make them live. Yeah. And, you know, they re- really weren't performance vehicles at that time. We were, you know, we were modifying, we were modifying to make them performance vehicles, but like the base of it was farm equipment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a Rhino wasn't <clears throat> designed to be a race no. car. And... You know, so so we actually there was a the WPSA. This was a a series that started that was competing against the AMA that I think was on ESPN, if I remember correctly. Dana got them to have a UTV race back at um, England English Town back in New Jersey, right? And that was kind of like the first big UTV race that I can remember. And so we brought cars all the way out there and went and raced that. And then I believe they had it on TV. And then I put that in the Huevos videos. And uh, yeah, so that when the first Razor 800 came out, that was like instantly better than a built Rhino. Yes. <laughs> so it, it was funny because I think Dana, we went to uh, State Line had a Supermoto. Yeah. And they ran UTVs in it. And Dana like smoked everybody in a bone stock uh, Razor 800. Yeah. And all the guys were in there built rhinos you know so. yeah the the evolution of it's really is really interesting and then you know obviously the the when they dropped the razor 1000 we you know we launched xp1k that launched that and yeah and we're like it, it was really we were doing the same thing it was like let's make a film about it and you know show the world what these vehicles are capable of and you know we you know we we're concerned with the the suspension was really, really good, but it didn't have the horsepower, so we actually had to add a turbo to it. And I remember, like, you know, that ruffled the feathers of all the engineers, and then, of course, they came out with the turbo version. You know, they're like, well, right. actually, you're right. You you Southern California <laughs> sickos, you know? Like, you just want horsepower and travel. You're just crazy. Nobody's going <laughs> to buy these things. And I'm like, oh, really? You know? Yeah. So, no, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a kind of a lot of history that goes back to the whole start of the UTV industry that maybe a lot of people aren't really that aware of. No, 100%, especially with what you did, you know, your contribution to, you know, propping up um, 
quad culture, right? Which was really, it's funny because we talk about it individualized, but, but it was, you know, it was motorsports slash power sports, you know, cultures. Like, you know, if you, you generally, you rode quads, you, before that, you probably rode a three wheeler, you had a bike, you had trucks, you know, it was interesting to grow, grow up in this culture and realize like, this is all the same people that are crossing over but corporations compartmentalized it so that they could sell you a product and so that they could keep your attention and be like, Hey, hey don't look at that. We, we need to sell you bikes. You're a bike guy. Here's your bikes, supercross, motocross, a little bit of desert. That's it. Don't look at those things over there. And that's not how culture works. Cultures like intermix. It's like food. You know, it's like nobody's just living off of hamburgers, right? Yeah. Or music, yeah. right? So, yeah, it was interesting, you know, and again, like I, I didn't know you at the time later on, we, we met, um, uh, actually through, uh, Christy, Christy, you know, who worked for me and her, like kept bugging me and like, Hey, you need to go meet this guy and everything. And I came out to your house and I'm like, okay, you know, you had this badass editing set up and you were kind of, I think you were, a you, you were kind of on the peak of what Wavos was. And then it, you know, the, the the industry and everything started slowing down after that. Yeah. Yeah. I think what mid two thousands or yeah. something, or maybe early two thousands. Yeah. So I uh, think we got the compound in Fallbrook, um, that we called the bomb shelter back. I say Oh four. Right. So it's probably like somewhere around that time, which was, yeah, that was kind of the heyday. And then, you know, by 2000, end of the two thousands, like 2009, 10 or so is like pretty much kind of coming to an end. Yeah. Yeah. The internet was kicking in. Um, so DVD sales were dying. Yeah. Um, you know, the economy was hurting. You had the power sports industry was kind of hurting. So they had it all cut back. They weren't spending the marketing dollars that they were. Um, so it was a, a little bit of a perfect storm that really kind of wiped out action sports films for the most part. Oh, it know, did. You know, from that point on, unless... <clears throat> It's produced by like Red Bull or Monster or yeah. something like that, where there's large outside funding. You just don't really see action sports films anymore. No, and there's there's some guys out there that are still doing them. Um, uh, you know, Dogger and Schweitzer are still out there doing you know films and um, you know on on freestyle motocross in particular. And you know, I I ho hope they continue to get any support that they can. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't, I think, I find it very bizarre that, like, you know, we could still have guys go compete at, you know, X Games or whatever, but then there's not enough money for supporting them throughout the year and, and, and doing these films, right? Um, so, you know, it, it did, it, you know, before we were, we were all, it, money was easy to get for the films, right? And then we were, we had done two films with Tommy Clowers and, you know, fortunately, in that situation, I mean, we had Target as a sponsor. So it was, it was the best sponsor in the world because they gave us money and then they bought tons of copies, right? Yeah. And, it, you know, but then it was like that ended and, you know, we're looking at the cost of doing the next film and we're like, yeah, we, we got to we gotta focus on something else and that's where uh, where UTVs and, and really, you know... Uh, uh, I think on the timeline, I think we hadn't done Jim Con at that point, <clears throat> um, and we started focusing more on on, on rally and off road. It, and I think Jim Connor kind of changed the game. Where prior to that, you had action sports films, yeah, yeah, and then Jim Connor kind of created the template of viral videos, definitely. And you know, so so then it, the the whole shift with all of your corporate sponsors, they didn't want to sponsor a film anymore. They wanted a viral video. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, 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 the, the whole paradigm's constantly shifting. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think now probably a good example of someone being successful with, with it would be like Axel Hodges. Yeah. You know, I think he's done very well with, you know, he's got his whole compound. They run X games out of his house. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, but I think what his brother shoots the majority of his stuff. Dirt and, Shark, yeah. I mean, there's and, he, yeah. I mean, 
he's got some tactical advantages. I mean, his brother works for Monster. He's on Monster, you know. Yeah. And he's an unbelievably amazing, you know, I, I don't even know what to call him, you know, uh, Moto Super God, right? Because the level of his, the level of control he has over his bike, I've never seen before. I mean, yeah. freestyle, supercross, m- moto, all of it combined, you know, and so he, I really feel he's taking it to the next level. But yeah, he, you know, he created that for himself. I, I'd say the only thing that I see now is, you know, I was actually talking to a young uh, professional skateboarder about this and he was lamenting to me about the state of skateboarding and about how difficult it is to, to survive as a pro. And, and, you know, one of the things that I identified in talking to him is that most of the brands aren't doing these big skate films. They're just putting out constant clips. And, uh, I don't know that that's clearly not serving them. Right. And same thing with Axel. It's like, you know, he, he puts out a lot of single clips that are amazing that get a lot of views but I think that like you could almost go back to the film format, right? Because I'm telling you right now, if if Axel dropped a film and said, "Hey, I'm premiering it at La Paloma in Encinitas, and it's twenty bucks," I'm paying the money. I want to go see it. And I want to I want to see it in that environment, and feel the energy of the crowd. Because I, I mean, you know, as a filmmaker, there's nothing that feels better when the crowd roars, right? When you yeah. when when you get that reaction, right, from from the crowd. That's one of the things that I don't like about you know the digital world of like, you know, you get all the troll comments and the likes and all that kind of stuff, but it's not the same as you know premiering your film and having everybody go crazy and having the big parties afterwards and that energy that it creates, and then watching. You know, for us, when we did it in skateboarding, and we didn't even, this is the funny thing is we were doing all the marketing for Osiris, and when they came out with their first film, I mean, we had, like, pretty much riots at the film premieres, right? And I way underestimated the amount of security. Like, I thought, oh, we need a couple guys to manage skateboarders. And we were at the theater down in San Diego, and, you know, 10,000 kids show up, and we're like, oh, shit. You know, yeah. how are we going to control them, right? And, uh, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. But um, I think that, uh, you know, I think it's time to go back to that and to kind of, you know, take control back from the social media companies and say, hey, it's cool you're there. It's cool you're, you're a tool to help spread our culture. But now you're not truly serving us. You're charging us money and you know your algorithm isn't really helping our culture we're going to we're going to go back to what we know was working in 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 you know uh manifesting our culture right so yeah yeah no i would agree with that you know um racing against your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get i've accomplished everything i wanted to do and now he's just like taking the reins I want to be remembered for being a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs> to go back to Axel, one of the things that I, I really appreciate what he's been doing is he's very progressive. Yeah. And you know, he, he hasn't been satisfied to just stay stagnant. So the things he's doing, um, you know, developing like the quarter pipe and just a, a lot of the stuff that he does, the, I like the forward thinking in that because that, sure. that was something that there's actually some of the stuff he's done. I was trying to get us to do on quads. We just didn't have the budget to build the things <laughs> that 100%. I wanted. I, you know? I know. I've and, been there. I've been trying to, uh, you know, like when, when, when RJ backflipped, I'm like, okay, this is going to be expensive. We're going to destroy cars we've got to get the ramp built correctly like it wasn't cheap yeah yeah and you know so that's where he's got a little bit of the perfect storm where he's got the monster dollars he's got the facility um you know so he can build a lot of those things but he's utilizing it and he has the talent to utilize yeah. it so you know it, it you know mad props to him i love watching his stuff i think as far as um 
in action sports. That's one of the kind of the people that I look at that I that's I think really kind of taking the bull by the horns and yeah. is is running with it. Um to back to the premieres, the yeah, when you premiered a movie in in front of a packed house, getting that response, there's nothing like that. Yeah. You know, that was awesome. And and having all the riders there and it's a big, you know, big party. Um versus now it's like you put a clip out and you're like, ooh, yay, we got a bunch yeah. of likes. Yeah. Yeah, it's just well, a, it's just lame like, in my opinion. <laughs> no, totally. And the thing is, like, although I guess you could argue that it does perpetuate the the culture because people see it, they emulate it, they go out and do it, right? There's that component to it. But, like, what you're not, you're not feeling the energy. You're not, you know, feeling the culture. Like, you know, again, for us, and, and it wasn't just us. It was all the people who were making films, right? Because we'd all go to each other's films and we'd look at what, what each other w- w- were doing and I would always go and look at other skate films and be like, oh, that's a good idea, you know? Or, or you know, wow, we, we should have thought of that. And, um, um, you know, we had Action Sports Retailer Show Convention, which was a B2B show technically, but you'd get in there, right? Most skateboarders would uh, figure out a way to get in, get a pass or whatever. But then there was parties, you know, for three nights, film premieres and everything. And, and that felt really good because you had this level of camaraderie and this energy that was like perpetuating everything and pushing everything forward. And, you know, I remember I was actually talking to one of the skate filmmakers, you know, just the other day that's, you know, done a lot of really amazing pieces. Right. And I was like, yeah, man, I, I miss that part of it. And he goes, you know, did you ever ask anybody how much money we were making back then? And I was like, no, I just wanted to get, I wanted to make something that made people react like the, to get that high. You know, I remember, you know, be experiencing that and being like literally taking notes and being like, Oh, we got to try this and try this and try this. It'll, it'll make it even more visceral. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely, I love that part of filmmaking. Something that, uh, that, that I've noticed and I was just talking to a friend of mine about is, so back when I grew up riding and, and getting started, th- there weren't a lot of cameras around. And so like when you went out to a spot and say you found a jump and you had 10 riders there, you know, it's like, all right, who's going to be the first one to hit it? And you did it to basically show your buddies that, you know, like to try to, you're always trying to one up each other. Right. Um, but you didn't do it for fame. You didn't do it for how many likes you were going to get on social media. And it was, you know, more, I guess, just natural. Um, and, you know, and, and then the going and, and doing that, I, I think a lot of action sports is kind of lost stuff now where I think the kids that are riding, you know, they won't do something unless there's a camera there or it's on Insta live or, you know, whatever they're doing. Right. And, um, so it, it'd be, it'd be nice if there was a, some sort of way to kind of get back to the roots, I think of a lot of these different sports that are, you know, in, in these industries and, you know, that, that's one of the things that I, I feel like social media and everyone's looking for instant attention sure. now. And, you know, it's, they, I think a lot of it is lost doing things for the love of it. Right. It's for the attention and the likes. Well, I think but, it's, I think, honestly, I think it's a mistake. And I think it's where social media has really fucked everything up, right? Because when you think about it from an art perspective, right? Like, okay, an, an art, uh, you know, opening gallery is the best way to show art that's been proven. Right. So because it, it gives people time to understand the weight of what you've done. it puts your art on a wall in a position where Im- immediately it's valued. Right. And so if you're not doing that, if you're, if you're just like, hey, cool, I just did this painting today, check it out, no big deal, it's no big deal, right? You're, you're kind of like, you're blowing it, right? And I think that's true of content in general. It's like, don't think of it as like, 
you know, oh, we got to chase the algorithm and we've got to feed the, the monster because that's not really going to work long term. That might get you a little bit of attention, but like ultimately you're playing to the mob, right? And we know how that worked with Rome, right? <laughs> didn't didn't work out very well. And so I think that when you, you have people who are really more creative and they push the envelope, you know, uh, um, and then kind of hold it back and present it in a, in, in a way that has a higher value, you know, then you get ultimately a better reward. Cause I, I don't know how many meetings I sat in with, you know, with XP one K or, um, Jim Kana with the, di these digital agencies going to be like, Matt, you can't do a clip over seven minutes. Nobody's going to like it. And da, 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 and all these rules. And I'm, I just look at my brother and I'm like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make what we think is appropriate and rad. And, if people like it, great. If not, then, you know, we probably don't have a job the next go around. But I believed in our capabilities and our ability to to know what was cool and authentic and, you know, be a off-roader from off-road culture and, and look at things and be like, that's rad, that's lame, right? And so, you know, I liken it to Metallica, right? It's like when they put out Ride the Lightning – there was no audience for that. You know, they just went in to a studio and made the sickest album that they could make that they liked, right? And then they went, we think this is bitching. They put it out into the world, and it created a genre of music that's massive now, right? Now it's yeah. easy to look back at it and be like, oh, yeah, that was brilliant. That was a great idea. But when they did it, you know, everybody's like, what are you guys, idiots? You should be playing this style because nobody likes this, and this is too aggressive, and... You know, what is this ride the lightning stuff? You know what I mean? Like, if you, yeah. they would have talked to a music executive, he would have talked them out of making that album, right? Yeah. And, I, and I think creative in general is the same way. It's like, you know what you have done and what you're capable of. And if, you know, like we were just talking earlier, like, if you just take Wavos and go, cool, we're going to do it in UTVs, nobody's ever done that before, right? And you and I see stuff every race that people do, and you're like, holy shit, did you see that? And it's unlocking that and putting in a film format that people can yeah. digest. Yeah, I think, you know, as a, a creative or an, an artist, being true to your vision is is important. And, and really, at life in general. Sure. You know, I think you can't listen to the noise too much. You've got a, if you've got a vision, you follow that vision and you do it to the best of your ability and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. You know, that's, I think, the best approach to life. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I feel like I've gone through that from starting Huevos. You know, when we first started doing the Huevos videos, there was a lot of people, you know, the magazines were knocking me because, oh, it's too crazy. It's too dangerous. The, the music's too loud. It's too fast. You know, but we just kind of kept true to what I felt it should be and, Instead of us changing to them, they changed to us. Yeah, you know, and they came around. Oh, you know, the, the, we love the music. You know, by the tenth video, they're talking about how cool it is that we're doing these big jumps, and we have this really heavy music in it. So, um, yeah, I think just staying true to who you are and what your vision is. Um, you know, and then even from from racing, you know, like I think racing quads. You know, people are like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You know, and then you prove them wrong. Yeah, and then racing UTVs. Yeah. You know, was, oh, you know, you, golf why, why are you doing that? You know, what, what's yeah. going on? And then, you know, like we go out and, and win. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, I mean, that's one of the things that I, I think I appreciate as a person is having those challenges and setting those personal challenges of, you know, do you have what it takes to do this and, and trying to push yourself and, sure. you know, seeing what goals you can achieve. And uh, I think that that's, uh, a really good way for people to approach their lives. I agree, but you also carry the the same punk rock ethos that that I'm, you know, I'm a part of and it's like this thing of like, okay, yeah, I get it. The majority of people are doing it this way, and that's usually because that's acceptable and that's the easier way to do stuff. You're not going against the 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 grain or, you know, what have you and that's one thing that I respect a lot about the Wavos series is in, in what the brand, right? Is that 
you know, you didn't have some big financial backer. You know, you had to piecemeal deals together to do things. And then, you know, when you get into the, the touring stuff, it's like it doesn't math out. Right. It's it's long drives, you know, shit tons of, of days and nights in a van and and shitty hotels and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then doing demos and being like, oh, yeah, we should probably not do this without health insurance, but we're going to do it anyways. Right. But it's almost like being in a band. When you look back at it, you're like, man, that was some of the funnest times I've ever had in my life. And I was broke, right? And I was like taking every piece of money that I had and going, okay, well, we'll do it again and we'll do it again and we'll do it again just to keep everything going. Um, you know, I, I saw the same, th same thing with freestyle motocross with Mark, right? It was like, fortunately for him, he was able to eventually turn it into a business. But the dude, those beginning days of freestyle motocross, like those dudes rolling around in a van and like, you know, crappy ramps and everything was sketchy and you know and what then I, I remember when it got into x games and that was like a huge moment for freestyle motocross like hey we think you, this is worthwhile right you guys aren't crazy and you know and then it it blew up and did all the things that it did for you know deegan and pastrana and you know the whole cast of characters right yeah, it's easy to look at it now and be like, oh, it's totally obvious. But like the dues those guys had to pay in the beginning, that was pretty rough. All right, Chase, number 23, it's 2023. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still got to eat. <laughs> Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was uh, a rough learning curve, you yeah. know. And and like you were saying, just there's so many shows where we travel around, and you know, you'd send them specs for a landing ramp, and th this was kind of the days where it was all dirt landers, and you know, and well, who, who knew what you were going to show up in? And, and see, yeah. you know, and, uh, and then especially like with international shows where you're using their quads and, um, yeah, there, there's uh, a, a lot of events that we went to that I was like, I, I don't even know how we're supposed to do this. Right. Um, you know, but that was all part of it. And, you know, it's like you said, when you look back at it, we all had a blast and we're all doing it for the love of it. Nobody was getting rich. You know, we were, we were trying, but, but, uh, you, you definitely, you, you weren't doing it for uh, your bank account. You were doing it for the love of the sport yeah. you know, when, when you did it. So. Yeah. And so, you know, that era of your life kind of, you know, uh, ends and you, you get back into racing UTVs and, you know, you had some really good success doing that. And, and uh, you know, recently you, you got in a trophy truck. Well, you know, talk about that. Yeah. So, um yeah, I raced quads almost my whole life. I started off on three wheelers and I quit racing quads in 2013. Um, we won our fifth score championship that year, I think, and we won the thousand. I was like, that that year, Caselli had passed away in the race. Uh, a friend of mine, Josh Frederick, got paralyzed at a works race. My friend Caleb passed away at Winter X. And I was just like, I'm 43 what else do I have to prove on a quad? Yeah. So I'm like, that's just, this is a good way to ride off into the sunset. And uh, yeah, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do after that. In 2015, I got an opportunity to race uh, a Razor. And so we did quite a few races that year. And then in 17, I got a factory sponsorship from Polaris. So I've been with them since that point. Um, you know, we won the Baja 1000, Baja 400, Vegas Torino in the unlimited class. But you know, we've, we've had some good runs and you know, I'm still out there competing. But uh, a, the, the beginning of this year, a buddy of mine bought uh, one of the Jimco trophy trucks. And so at the Baja 500, um, two of my friends are going to be driving it. So a good buddy of mine, BC, he actually... It's a, a, a long story how we met, but 
we were, he was in a band called Head PE that was out of Huntington Beach. Yep. And I wanted to use one of their songs in a Huevos video. So I was actually down in Baja racing. This is like 98. And I think I was in Catavina, which is in the middle of nowhere. And this was back, kind of maybe cell phones exist. I guess they did, but like, was when, when you're in Baja, yeah. like you, you, when you cross the border, like you had the money you needed on you. <laughs> you told your friends, <clears throat> hey, I'm going to leave today and I'll be back in two weeks. Yeah. If I'm not back in two weeks, you know, send, somebody. send, send, send yeah. people for me. Or Start whatever. looking for me. And, uh, but at Catavina at the hotel there, you could pay as like $10 a minute or something to use a phone that they had to call to the States. Yeah. And we were getting ready to release the movie and I needed to get all of my ducks in a row. So I got BC's number, called him, was like, hey man, we want to um, use a head song. And he's like, hell yeah, you know, what's it for? And I'm like, a quad video. He's like, oh dude, I got a banshee. And like, so we kind of hit it off right away and um, ended up becoming good buddies. I would go to a ton of head shows, had a blast. And then um, the original head PE broke up. And BC ended up coming and working for me. He helped manage the bomb squad and, and sales manage for H bomb films. So we've got a long history together, but um, his friend Ryan is the one that bought the truck. Ryan, Ryan's a friend of mine too, but uh, those two guys are going to drive it. Neither of them have raced Baja. They don't have a ton of experience. So they asked me if I would co-drive with BC kind of help show them the ropes and go pre-run with them and stuff. So we went out there. I'd never even sat in a trophy truck prior to that. So that was pretty amazing. Um, it, to, to me, it's like having all the cheat codes for a video game or something. Right. You know, Cause I'm used to, even my UTV now is like cheating versus what I raced in, in 2015. Right. But uh, the things that you've got to do, I, I feel like in a UTV, you've got to be, a lot more precise yeah. and just the car can't take what a trophy truck can take. Oh, you know? So if close. you hit a big three foot deep rain rut or something like that, you're going to rip a corner off of the car on a UTV Yeah. versus the trophy truck with the big tires, big suspension. They just go right through it. So that was, that is what really impressed me in the trophy truck is you hop in the thing you're going fast, but you don't really feel like you're going that fast because they work so well. Um, but I would just kind of pucker up a little bit of, you know, we're coming at something and I'm like, oh shit, you better check up. And he wouldn't, but then we'd glide right through it. And I'm like, oh man, like I need to be driving one of these things. <laughs> exactly. So anybody out there watching, if you need an experienced desert racer, drive your trophy truck. I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was really cool because, you know, obviously BC is a friend of mine as well. And we were, you know, when we were talking about it, he's like, yeah, I want, I want Wes to co-drive with me because Wes got me into this, you know, and I'm like, okay. And, you know, obviously we're friends. I know you have a shit ton of, of, you know, of, of, you know, race knowledge, right. Of race craft. And I'm like, yeah, awesome. You know, I think, you know, it's the best decision and, and you guys got to finish. I mean, most guys... I don't know. I don't know what the average is. It'd be interesting, but I would guess it's like five races before they finish. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? Let alone get a Baja 500 finish. So it was pretty cool to watch that process, right? So, um, but yeah, and you're you're still racing UTVs and and you know still winning races. So, what what's next for you? Um, you know, still doing the UTV thing, having fun with that. You know, uh, it's kind of funny because I feel like a ton of the top UTV guys are all ex quad guys. Oh, for sure they are. So it's like Cafro in there. The, oh, the I Matt mean, Locks, Matt or... Locks, Cafro, um, Cody Miller, Hunter Miller, um, you know, Brandon Sims. I think is, comes from a quad background. Piplet comes from a quad background. Um, I don't know if Romo does or not. I kind of feel like he may have as well. But I mean. The list goes on and on. I mean, back yeah. east, you know, Tim Farr, he he still races at Cranon and does well. Um, I think Kyle Cheney actually has quad background. Right. Um, you know, it's it's endless. Right. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm having fun with that. Um, still kind of trying to decide what I'm going to be doing next year with that 
whether I build a new car or not, a little on the fence. I feel like you know, when UTV racing started, it was more of a price point class that you could go race, more of a driver's class. And it's just becoming more and more expensive to go build a car. You know, I think the car that I was going to build last year, we would have been probably around $250,000 to build what I felt like was going to be a really competitive, competitive car. car. Yeah. Um, you know, and now you're getting into, I mean, I could buy a used trophy spec for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's just, but you don't have the sponsorship support. Yeah. So there's a little of a catch 22 there, but, um, one of the things I've been doing this year is racing in my production pro R yeah. and kind of trying to build some momentum there. Um, what I would like to see is a, a pro stock class in the UTVs where, um, what's weird now is you've got a lot of the manufacturers are divided up yeah. by class and you know, I'd like to get everybody back together. So, you know, say it's a 1000 CC turbo, 2000 CC NA. That way you try to get as many of the different manufacturers racing head to head again. I think that might need to change here shortly with sure. some new things coming out. But, um, you know, and, and if you got to run like a restrictor plate or something to level the playing field of the cars. Sure. Um, but making them more stock based, more production based where I think, I think it's better for the manufacturers because your average enthusiast is going to be able to relate to that better. Yeah. Um, as well as your barrier to entry is going to be less. So well, you're going to have guys that are maybe good drivers that couldn't afford a $250,000 UTV yeah. that could come do this. Well, I so. agree with you. And I think too, like the equipment has gotten so good. I mean, the pro R is a race car. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you, you know, now really all you need to do to that is do tires, wheels, safety equipment, you know, your GPS is your radios and, and you've got a race car. I mean, that car is very impressive out of the box. Uh, obviously yeah, definitely. the Can-Am platform is really, you know, proven to be really good i mean when you look at um phil blurton's car compared to everybody else's it's just a it's really a stock car that's been stripped down and you know of course he's got his suspension and a few of his things on it but you know it's not the bdi <clears throat> geyser car that's you know all carbon fiber right so yeah i agree with you i think it's interesting and i definitely if i have anything to do with it which i do <laughs> I, yeah. I want to see more of that, you know, because it, you know, the, I, I feel like it's too divided right now. Right. And what I hate the, like, Hey, everybody wins. You know, I hate that, mm -hmm. you know, because I think the merit of our culture is that we're putting on a contest and it has to be true. You know, it has to be, you can't erode the value by giving everybody a trophy you that trophy has to mean something you know at the end of it you have to cross that finish line and you're like my, i got my ass kicked right? yeah and you earned it and you know you battled with your competitors you battled with you know the desert you battled with the equipment you know and and it's it's got to be hard you know um but you know the competition it needs to be there i i really don't like you know, the, <clears throat> the classes that have one or two guys, you know, I, that's to me pointless of, you know, racing. And then what, what's even worse is when, when guys are kind of like, you know, making a vehicle and they're like, Oh, they come to us and they're like, well, this vehicle doesn't fit into any class. Will you make us a class? I'm like, really? You know, go get 40 of your friends and, you know, get it together. And if, if that's the case, then, then come to us. But yeah, you know, our class rules, are public you can google them it, it tells you how to build the car you know what the you know what the requirements are and it's really not rocket science and for the most part all these classes exist and you can look at other cars hell you can go to car builders you know you want to come race utvs and you want to start with a, a race winning car call lone star up you know what i mean it's it's going to cost you a couple of bucks but like your turnkey you know, racing the same car that Brandon Sims has, that Mitch Guthrie has, right? So it's yeah. it's pretty accessible. But I agree with you on the finance side of it. Of like, UTVs has, has got more and more expensive than I feel they should be. 
Yeah. I mean, that's the pro arb in racing this year. It's got bolt on cage, seats and harnesses, um, you know, a bolt on fuel cell that we're using as like a transfer tank. And yeah, you know, there's nothing too crazy on it. Probably the biggest addition that I made is I put King shocks on it. Right. And, uh, you know, that made a huge difference, but you know, if, if the class dictated you had to run stock shocks, that's fine. I kind of feel like shocks because there's so many different ones that even come on the models themselves. It's probably okay to be open, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'd like to see the classes cut down in all of the racing bodies where, you know, you have a pro UTV class, whatever that is. You know, if it's based off of the unlimited class right now and you figure out a way. You know, t- to me, the everyone was so concerned when the Pro R came out yeah. that it was just going to blow everybody away. But... It hasn't really been the case in a lot of races where no. you know the, the Can-Ams and the the Pro R, um, you know, in full race build, are fairly com- yeah. competitive against each other. So I, I'd like to see them racing against each yeah, other I, in the same class. I, I agree. I mean, now we have two years of da- data that we can look at yeah. and we can go, okay, cool, right? You know, like you said, like when that car came out, I'm like, this is a four cylinder bigger gnarlier car like you know i think this is gonna you know be way faster and you know to your point really it really hasn't so i agree i think we can you know we could start mixing it up make it interesting yeah Again, it's generally when I've been racing, we compete for the overall, right? UTV overall. Not we're not beating trophy trucks, but oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, like, and, and that's when I was talking about my wins. When I won the Baja One Thousand in score, that was UTV overall. I call that a win. Yeah, 100%. Baja Four Hundred. We won the overall. That's a win. That's why when <clears> I said <throat> Vegas Torino, I said in the unlimited class. Right. Because I didn't win the overall. Win. I was a class win. You know, which oh, a win's a win, but, and there is something to that. A win's that. a win, but it not, oh, not when but you, it, but when it's you not win the overall. overall. No. Yeah. It's, no. it's the same, it's the same at the very top too. It's like, you know, cool. Like you've got, you know, multiple classes now of, of trophy trucks with, you know, with uh, um, the, the old dude's class, right? And then, yeah. you know, now we've got 6100s that are basically as fast as trophy trucks. And then, you know, we're talking about splitting two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive. Still, everybody's entering that with the idea that, like, they want to get the overall. Yeah. And if they don't, then they'll settle for a class win. You know, and it's the same with UTVs. Yeah. And I think UTVs is even more interesting because you have – vehicles like the pro r that's relatively in its stock form it could get the overall you know yeah. we i was talking to cafro about this and like you know he he felt that same way of like yeah i'm i'm going and if i get a class win that's great but like my goal is to get the overall yeah I, I think most of your serious racers, they're not there for a class win. They're there to win the overall. And yeah, that was even when I was racing quads, you wanted that Indian, which was that was with a trophy that you got in score for an overall. Yep. And they they still do the same thing. You get a separate trophy for the overall. And that those are the ones that are like up 100%, in my shop. Hundred percent. You know, that's what I'm proud of. A, a class win. It's like, okay. You know, and, and depending on what class it is, right. You know, if you're in a bone stock car or something then you know okay i think that's got a little bit more credibility than if say you're turbo and unlimited and you know you you win the unlimited but you you're the sixth place turbo well right. there's not that big of a difference between those two cars so that that doesn't mean as much to me 100 percent. so you know it, it'd be nice to streamline the classes i think 
you know, you have pro UTV, whatever that ends up being. And then I think you have like pro stock and, you know, then you can have some other classes like NA for the guys that still have those cars, but right. you know, they're, they're more for fun, I think, versus trying to compete for an overall. Yeah. And then you have like a sportsman class that's yeah, like, or, you know, if or, you want to learn. Yeah. Or NA becomes a rookie class where it's like, Hey, you want to come race, start here. Yeah. Right, get used to the vehicle and then step up to a you know a turboed car or a pro R, right? You yeah. know, or whatever the next Can Am thing is that's supposed to be coming. So, right, you know, we'll see. But it, it's you know, it regardless, it's exciting to see you know guys like you transfer over into UTV racing, you know, because I think that race craft that you developed in quads definitely you know, transfers over and gives you an advantage, especially in Baja. You know, yeah. it's like we, we saw this at the UTV World Championship a couple of years ago where, like, you know, we we built the um, course in Havasu, and it was really technical. And all the guys in Baja were, like, one, two, three in every class because they've experienced that in Baja. But racing in America uh, has been pretty tame, you know, comparatively. Yeah. Uh, but we're we're going to change that. We, we're we're yeah. throwing a big monkey wrench in that. So, well, I mean, that's what I liked about the California 300 the last year was that actually had some technical sections in yeah. it. And what one of the things I always say about racing Baja versus you know, kind of most of the races in the states is there's more to separate them in from the boys down there. Yeah, of, you got to do more homework, and there's just more technical sections and more gotchas that you know they they don't grade. The washouts and no. the rain ruts. And, well, I, at, at the last 500, everybody was getting stuck at race mile 405 or whatever because there was right. a big rain rut there. And people were rolling over. And like, oh, I actually did a video going through there and my razor going, this is easy. Just straddle it. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, that I'm enjoying your your uh, the, your taco tips, right? That, was, that <laughs> yeah. was fun when we were down there. We took you to one of our spots and had some good fish tacos. Yeah. So, you know, outside of racing... Um, you're kind of asking what I've been doing. And so I've got a, a few projects. I'm trying to get back into doing more production and e e even uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, you know, I'm getting up there a little bit racing. So I've got to be looking at, you know, what other things can I be doing? So we've been doing the taco tiempo, doing the taco reviews. I enjoy doing that. Um, we have a, a series that, I did with Maxis with Rockstars that we're going to be launching here pretty quickly. Um, I don't want to give up too much, but uh, I think everyone's going to really enjoy that. And then we've got the Huevos documentary that we're doing. So um, you know, I've been pretty wide open working on all these different projects. And then I've, with Score, I've been doing um, on track commentary i guess basically where we go out ahead of time and do course overviews yeah um yeah, i'm available for the mint 400 well it's and been california 300 it's been cool all right I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make a note right no pressure but no it's been cool like i've i've enjoyed those things because you know look we're friends but but also i think it's important for you know intelligent people to articulate things in our culture and our sport so that other people can understand them Right, because one of the things that bothers me is, you know, when you know commentators come from other sports that don't know shit about off road, but just because they're a commentator, they get the gig, right? And so then they're like, you know, you're listening to, to, to them to talk, and it's just bullshit, right? And they're doing the gloss over, and I'm like, come on, you know right. what I mean? Get this guy out of here, this gal out of here, whoever it is, and you know, find the people within our culture that can speak well on camera and intelligently articulate the value of what's going on and, you know, talk about these little details because it's, it's rad. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like I do the drama, you know, the drama of that section, I'm laughing. I'm like, this is great, right? Because it, it's psyching everybody out. Like some people are like, oh God, that section, you know, and then you do this clip and you're like, actually, you just straddle it. And if you have four wheel drive, it's really not a problem. Then if you're, you know, if your truck doesn't, or if your vehicle doesn't weigh 5,000 pounds, did you guys go through that section in the trophy truck? 
Yeah, yeah, we did. The, the funny thing was, is people get so fixated on an obstacle mm-hmm. that they don't look around yeah. and and see what, what's really going on there. So um, in, in that spot, you had a really deep rut down the middle, and then people started taking a high line that was off camber to the top. Yeah. Well, we cruised through there, and I looked, and there was just a f- flat area to the left. Yeah. No one was going through it yet. Yeah. So I told BC, I'm like, hey, we're going to go through the flat to the left. Yeah. So we we did that in the race, and we literally just cruised right around it to yeah. the left. And you had all these guys rolling, going on the off camera, getting stuck in the rut. Everyone's freaking out. And it's like, hey, if you just calm down for a second, you didn't fixate on what you're scared of. Right. There was an easy line right on the yeah. side. But and, that comes from but, racecraft, you know, from yeah, years of Yeah, well, doing I mean, that's. I've got, well, if I race the Baja 1000 this year, it'll be my 25th Baja 1000. Nice. You know, so my, my first Baja 1000 was 95. Nice. And uh, I missed a couple, but my first score race was actually an 86 on a three-wheeler. There you go. So I'm uh, kind of dating myself, but like, the gray beard <laughs> does that for me too. I think, yeah, so. right on. <laughs> well, this has but, been awesome, dude. I really appreciate the time, and uh, I know we only scratched the surface, so we'll have to do another one. Thanks for yeah, coming, brother. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Of course.